Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, served them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk. I'm host of this series of half-hour weekly public access programs. Um, today our guests are Susan Barrett and Emily Crum. They are co-founders of Save Our Schools. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great. Thanks for having us. So, I, I, before we start talking about Save Our Schools, your new organization, I'd like to talk a little bit or familiarize our audience with uh, stand for Children, which I think, I know you were associated with, I'm not sure if you were associated so with much, that. No. Okay, so tell us a little bit about uh, Stand for Children. Sure. Um, well, thanks again for having us here today. Uh, I was a member of Stand for Children. I, I guess I became a member back in 2007 or so when my oldest daughter entered kindergarten. And as a parent, I saw that there were so many different ways to volunteer in the school, but I really wanted to volunteer in a way that would benefit all schools, all children, and I thought Stanford Children would be that vehicle. So I became a member, but as a working parent, I didn't have a whole lot of time, but I felt like, wow, here's this group that can help me raise my voice on issues. Um, and I thought it was mainly focused around getting more funding for our schools. And really at the time, I, I think they were, although that was what kind I, of the original mission. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, and really um, helping to provide services for low-income children. I mean, they seem to, at least in Oregon, have a genuine mission um, in that regards. But what happened was um, uh, things started to change for them. And when I became um, I, a Stand for Children team leader, this is still a volunteer position, but they basically asked someone from each school where there's a Stand for Children team to be a member and join their strategy team. So you meet once a month, come together. When I did that, what I realized was way more things going on behind the scenes that the average member would not see. For example, 
I joined this um, committee called Education Innovation Committee because I thought, okay, educa education innovation, that sounds wonderful. That's about bringing, um, you know, more, uh, you know, activities to our students and making education really engaging and so forth. And I thought this would be wonderful. What it actually turned out being, however, was this very, very tiny elite group talking about how um, we should go through the teacher's contract line by line. And that conversation started after a woman from DFER, Democrats for Education Reform, came into this meeting and started talking about the wonderful things Democrats for Education Reform was doing and um, what was happening in New York City with um, Ava, Ma I'm not sure I'm going to get her name right, Ava Moskowitz, this woman who's basically um, started these uh, private charter schools. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even really know these names, these groups, until just there were all these things that were adding up that didn't make sense and really didn't seem to be in the best interests of children. The other thing I realized was that um, they would, um, in regards to things they wanted parents to push for and promote, they would tell you at the last minute. For example, they ask these team leaders to go to a legislative breakfast that you know happens at the start of each legislative session. So this year is in January, and we're supposed to sit down at a table and talk to our legislators. Sounds great. You sign up to do this, but we didn't get the actual stand agenda until probably at most a week before this, and then that's what we're there to promote when we don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you think about it, you realize, is this really as a parent what I would be promoting? You know, and um, and then there were other things such as um, it, I know in this last legislative session, um, we had gotten an email from Sue Levin, who's the executive director of Stanford Children in Oregon, um, saying how we should urge our legislators to push through this package, and in bold print, what catches your eye was, you know, the wording about how this will save our teachers, you know, save their jobs. And as a parent, you don't want to see more teachers cut because, mm -hmm. I mean, our class sizes have grown exponentially. So, of course, I'm going to try to support that. But then you read the finer print below and it talks about, you know, how this will expand charter schools and online um, schools. And it's just like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Now, that's actually going to pull resources mm -hmm. out of our schools, you know, and I, I feel they're really they're definitely pushing this whole corporate reform agenda right now that I see as a whole conquer and divide strategy, you know, pitting parents against teachers and also just driving more people out of our public schools, which I see is again, a divide and conquer strategy, you know, because for corporations that aren't interested in having their taxes raised, it's really handy to have parents just focused on their own schools rather than coming together to unite for public schools in general. Okay, and, and so you formed you formed this new organization, yeah. Save, Save Our Schools. Exactly, well Oregon Save Our Schools to be Oregon specific, okay. just because there is a national group called Save Our Schools, and so how this came about was I was getting incredibly frustrated with Stanford Children, and I actually sat down with their executive director and realized that there was no way they were going to get back to a genuine agenda. I mean, they even, um, you know, were promoting things such as um, lowering the capital gains tax rate in this last um, session. So, I um, can, can, we, can we go back to right <laughs> stuff for just a moment? So, why why would why would they be promoting a, a, a cut in tax uh, in uh, capital gains taxes? Well, when I asked the executive director about that, because I wasn't even really aware of that, you know, because they've all along they've asked for us to um, repeal the kicker, which makes total sense, and mm -hmm. they still stay strong on that message. And um, but it was part of this package that was happening, and and and, and what um, Sue Levin mentioned was that she said that we have to um, be credible. It's something about, like, we need some clout. We have to be taken seriously. She said that with this package, the kicker is something that would go into the um, Constitution. So then if we could get the kicker repealed, that part would be set in the Constitution and would be so much harder to ever change back again. And raising or lowering the capital gains tax rate, that wouldn't be in the Constitution. So if people didn't like it, you know, we could always fight to have that changed. Oh. Bush established this No Child Left Behind uh, program, uh, legislation, law, 
and schools have been trying to meet those, and that's primarily been based on testing. Is, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And your organization has a problem with that? Mm -hmm. So tell us a little more detail about No Child Left Behind, what, what the objections are. So No Child Left Behind has been around for over 10 years now, and it hasn't shown any school growth. Actually, they're seeing how uh, you know a huge majority of the schools in the nation are going to be failing by No Child Left Behind standards. And what it's really done for education is it's narrowed education. It's narrowed it to the point that we are so concerned about high-stakes testing that that becomes the focus of, of what uh, students um, experience in education is. So they're so focused on passing tests that um, your curriculum becomes again about passing tests. So um, for instance in the school I work in um, last year the principal encouraged teachers to spend more time on math and because the math test was going to be such a, um, a huge um, part of what the state was going to look at for funding and we wanted to make sure we were close to passing AYP. So when you don't pass AYP, then your school has all these other restrictions placed upon it. And um, if you continually don't pass AYP, you have things like students have to be bus or can be bused to other schools. Um, at our school this year, we have a tutoring program that comes, um, private tutoring companies come and will tutor our students after school, not knowing what they needed help on. You know, they don't talk to the teachers. They don't see, you know, their test scores and see if it's reading or math or what, you know, what area they might need more assistance in. So mm -hmm. it, it just, it creates this narrowed curriculum, like I said. And so we're tying a lot of our curriculum purchasing off of what is the test going to, you know, what's going to be on the test? How, did, how is that going to affect um, the students and our school in general? And the amount of time spent on testing um, at the school I work at was over, um, five weeks last year at least of, of testing itself. So the Whoa. students take the test three times a year to see if they pass the test. And then if they pass the test, sometimes they're given rewards for passing the test. Like they get to go to a popcorn party while the other kids have to go take the test again. So does that make you feel really good about you know your school environment when you, you're like, oh, my friend gets to go have this popcorn party, but mm -hmm. I'm stupid. I have to take the test another time. And now we are even at the point where students are taking tests to see if they're gonna pass the test. So you're spending um, exuberant amounts of time on test taking and not on art or history or science. Science has been taken out of you know the school curriculum and really being able to um, have a holistic type of education where now it's just so focused on are they going to pass the reading test, are they going to pass the math test, and and those concerns. Um, are are huge and they've they've made it really hard for teachers because they feel pressure students feel pressure the principal feels pressure and there's just this high anxiety that happens in in a school setting now instead of a collaborative you know type of let's let's really teach what um to a whole child where they're at differentiating for the each kid and and knowing that there's growth happening and seeing how we can look at the growth of students instead of penalizing schools for not getting to the certain certain percentage it's putting all children in the same box it's putting all schools in the same box when there's huge differences in resources and backgrounds and experiences that the kids and and the teachers you know have to deal with so so you're saying the kids are not benefiting from all this testing no mm -mm. who benefits from the testing test companies <laughs> and Absolutely. you know the test companies Pearson um, publishing Bill Gates who's connected now with Pearson there's a move to national uh, have national core standards in our country so that's gonna monopolize the testing industry even more because we're all required to teach the same standards in our country. So of course, all the children can take the same test and um, that's gonna make somebody a lot of money. All right. yeah. now, you mentioned a AYP, what yes. was AYP? Um, it's a a AYP is average yearly um, progress or percentage of growth. And so that is what this, the government um, looks at for their funding and seeing whether or not schools are um, are showing that growth and um, able to pass this certain percentage that they, they have to have to meet. And it's always, it was ever changing. That was another issue. It was the target was always moving and to the point where they wanted 100% of students achieving, which just seems <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So in the last legislature, mm -hmm. uh, the legislature looked at some proposed educational changes 
Can we just describe what some of those changes are? And there were some things that basically happened very quickly and behind closed doors. And for example, um, expanding online charters. So you look at that, and you know, for some kids, sure, maybe an online school is the perfect setting for them. But this whole expansion of online charters, when you look at who is pushing that, you have um, uh, Matt Wingard, right, in the legislature, who was on the payroll of Connections Academy. So at the same time that he was in the legislature, oh, yes, yes. he was also on the payroll of somebody exactly. else who would benefit from the decision or potentially benefit. Right. Okay. And that group just coincidentally happens to have just recently been bought out by Pearson Publishing, who um, Emily pointed to. Pearson is, um, you know, they produce curriculum and testing products, and they are recording record profits. So it opens the door for more of that. And there was also um, a bill that allowed for um, transfers out of districts. Mm -hmm. You look at that and you realize, you know, um, students who come from families with means, they can get around to those other districts. They have more choices, but it certainly leaves kids behind. And if we don't put resources into our schools and really build up all our schools, which is what we should be doing, then those who have the means to, you know, drive across town, they can do that. But we definitely leave many kids behind. So, okay. All right. and, and so th there's something about uh, LearnWorks. Oh. Tell us about LearnWorks. Is oh. that a private corporation? Is that a program or proposal? Oh. Or? Well, LearnWorks is this group of 30 people handpicked by the Oregon Business Council to develop a plan to be presented to the Oregon Education Investment Board. And this, and that, that, that's a state agency? Yes. Okay. So actually what, another thing that happened then in this last legislative session is there was this Senate Bill 909 um, that uh, one thing it did is it's giving the governor this power to be, you know, the chief of education. We're not yes. going to have, you know, the superintendent of schools anymore. Um, and he wants to coordinate services, you know, from pre-K, you know, into graduate school. That right there I don't particularly have a problem with, but it seems like it's opening the door for all these other things. And um, what we've discovered is this LearnWorks proposal was actually funded um, a couple years ago by the Gates Foundation. One of the researchers they pointed to, funded by the Gates Foundation. These people are handpicked. Many of them are um, have close ties to stand for children. And when you look at this proposal, the thing that just there were a couple of things that really just put me on edge. First of all, when I went down to um, one of the hearings for this, the governor thanked Knowledge Universe right off the bat. Knowledge Universe is a, a private company um, that it was started by um, Mike Milken of Junk Bond fame. Oh, yes. uh -huh. And they have a whole online learning component. And that's who he's thanking. For, the, for their grand work with, with this whole proposal. And, um, and then, as I started listening to the proposal, they make lots of it sound pretty good in their little dog and pony show. But when you sit down and look at the details, one of the things they had in it, um, they have in it right now, are um, a plan for when a, uh, a school is making progress and when a school isn't. Actually, they refer to it as delivery entities making progress, and delivery entities not making progress. Sounds inhumane. Yeah, it absolutely <laughs> sounds inhumane. Sounds like a medical model. <laughs> <laughs> and for those um, not making progress, there are still these same incredibly punitive measures where um, a school would have to go through these four steps, um, bringing in external resources, so again, privatizing our schools, bringing in these external tutors and coaches and so forth, which I was at a, a, um, a reauthorization hearing for No Child Left Behind listening to a principal talk about how she's, she has to, her school has to spend $170 an hour for an untrained tutor mm -hmm. to come in and tutor kids who just are not making progress. And so you see how this is just totally tied to um, privatizing schools and to these for-profit companies. So this LearnWorks proposal still has those measures ultimately ending up in receivership. As if, you know, so we're going to be turning over our schools? Who are we turning them over to? 
Okay, and then for those that are making progress, well, they are the lucky ones that get to have um, challenging grant opportunities that they get to apply for. So if you're making progress, you get more money. Uh -huh. And if you're not, you don't. And one of the uh, members of this LearnWorks group actually said, this proposal will make us much more attractive to the Gates Foundation. We don't need to be doing things to our education system that are attractive to the Gates Foundation. They need to be things that actually work for all our students. Mm -hmm. They need to be things that parents and teachers who are actually in our system you know, can really um, see benefits from. You know, that's who they should be talking to. We don't need them talking to the Oregon Business Council. I mean, for heaven's sakes, um, Arnie Duncan came out um, just, what was it, a week ago, uh, uh, November, when was it, October 12th? October 12th. We had a protest oh. that day. <laughs> yeah, October To talk 12th. to the Oregon Business Council. Hmm. We should and, be talking no, to Arnie parents Duncan and teachers. Is. October business, or he was talking to the um, Oregon Business Association. He was the keynote at their at their dinner to speak on. Um, the governor brought him. He's the secretary of education to speak to um, to this group of business leaders, and he had no intention at that time to speak to teachers. The um, the Oregon Education Association. Um, the Association for Teachers, the Teachers Union, um, pressured him to have a town hall. But his original intent was to come here just to speak to business leaders. So it's it's disconcerting that our Secretary of Education is speaking only to business leaders, that our governor of um, our state, who's now the leader of education in our state, is only speaking to business leaders. There is one teacher on his um, Oregon investment um, at Oregon Education Investment Team, and that is the union um, vice president. So um, that's concerning that he, everybody else on the team is connected to Stanford Children, Chalkboard Project, these corporations that are um, and corporately funded um, groups that are just pushing, again, their corporate ag agenda and for privatizing education. Okay. Yeah. And, and what's really interesting about this, too, is I um, recently wrote an editorial just asking the governor's team, you know, can we please have a public dialogue on any plan that's coming out of this team? What's interesting is that the first um, response came from Stanford Children. Hmm. Makes you wonder who's really running Salem at this point in time. I mean, truthfully, I think they have completely infested the capital, and it feels like the capital needs to be fumigated at this point <laughs> and get them out of there. So, okay. All right. yeah. well, you, you probably need to talk with our guest from last week, which was mm -hmm. Barbara Dudley with the Oregon Working Families Party, and, mm. and see if the if the Oregon Working Families Party might be interested in helping to fumigate the capital. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So you, you mentioned receivership. Are there any schools in receivership? What does receivership mean, and who does, who does, who's the receiver? Well, um, at this point, I don't know locally if we have any in receivership. Um, one thing that's really scary about this, from what you can see in other places, is that basically schools can be turned over to for-profit entities. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really scares me right now is there is a charter management organization that has um, two Stanford Children people um, starting it, Jonah Edelman, the executive director of Stanford, uh, of Stanford Children nationally, he's the founder of it, and Whitney Grubbs, who's not only a Stanford Children team leader, but also um, assistant education advisor to the governor. And they have this charter management organization, and they are opening up, or planning to open up um, a charter school in Gresham Barlow, specifically targeted for students from schools that are not making progress. That just doesn't seem right. <laughs> And I, th I feel like we should discuss a little bit about the whole not making progress because what that looks like is just not making progress by the standards of AYP and, mm -hmm. and high stakes testing. No, they're not looking at these other forms of, of progress in education as to, um, a, again, a more holistic approach to see growth, to see students' writing samples, to see um, more of how students are showing growth and progress in that manner. It's just based off of again, the high stakes testing. So that's another issue and, and concern about just looking at high stakes testing. Yeah, our, our half hour is just about over. <laughs> so I, I'd like the camera, if you can, to focus on the Rethinking Schools magazine and just tell us what the Rethinking Schools is real quickly. Sure, the, uh, well the Rethinking Schools, that particular magazine, what it does is it um, has an article in it that shows how Stanford Children changed over time. But Rethinking Schools in general is just a nonprofit organization really um, working to um, 
provide a more um, culturally diverse curriculum free from uh, the influences of these uh, for-profit publishing companies that really reflect the diverse backgrounds of students. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you both for being here. This has been uh, very informative. <laughs> right. I, yeah, and, and the education is not something that I usually follow. It's just it's it happens all the time. And, you know, and I read things about Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation giving a lot of money to the Portland school districts to divide schools into little clusters and so forth, which always sounds good. But <laughs> you're suggesting that maybe there's another agenda there. And Susan, tell us tell us why you founded Save Our. Uh, save Our Schools. Yeah, Oregon Save Our Schools. So um, basically when I stepped away from Stanford Children, I still knew a number of parents that really wanted to work to improve our schools for all kids. And I was trying to figure out, you know, who in Oregon is really doing that. There are lots of groups doing little things here and there, but there wasn't anyone like really pushing for more funding for our schools and so forth. And I'd found an organization called Parents Across America. And I um, tapped into them and I thought they had a really good model. But also um, they were um, tapping into the national Save Our Schools march that was happening in DC over the summer. And that also looked like it was kind of uh, fitting the bill of the frustrations that the parents I knew were experiencing as well. So um, I ended up actually going to that Save Our Schools march in DC, but also I wanted to find a way to bring some of what they were doing into Oregon. And so I looked them up, found out they had an information coordinator mm -hmm. who is Emily. And that's how Emily and I connected. And so we basically joined forces and we um, have been, you know, just this, uh, group kind of moving along. We didn't even give ourselves a name till I think about uh, a month ago. Oh. And we decided on Oregon Save Our Schools. And really it's a group of teachers, parents, students, and community members um, and people, you know, that are really caring and want to see public education, you know, t um, not taken over by this corporate education reform. Okay. Yeah. And, and tell us, how, how do people get in contact with you? Well, we don't have a website yet, yet, but we do have a Facebook page, um, Oregon SOS. Just look it up on Facebook. We also have um, an email account, OregonSOSinfo at gmail.com. So mm -hmm. thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Great. So uh, that concludes our program for today. Um, if your local public access station does not broadcast populist dialogues, contact the station and request that they do so. Populist Dialogues are available to them at no charge um, at www.pegmedia.org. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www. AFD dash PDX. I want to thank the crew today for being here. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be on the air. So thank you to Janet Morris, Joan Horton, Tom Thomas, Roger Bates, Dave King. I want to thank the audience for watching us again. We are on every week uh, here in the Portland metropolitan area, and we hope that you'll join us again next week. Thank you.